I'd come home, it was two o'clock in the morning, there was a script underneath my door, and I started reading it, and I couldn't put it down. It was some of the most riveting characters I'd read in a long, long time. So it was not even a second thought before I turned it in. Kathy gave me the script. She read it and liked it and insisted that I read it immediately, and I read it that night, and it was incredible. So uh, I said, this is great, let's buy it, and we'll get an amazing director. And she said, well, there's one catch. The writer has got to be the director. I said, great, well, what's he directed? And she said, well, nothing yet. So I flew into New York and had a meeting with Jim, who was very smart, very impressive, and we made a deal. We bought the script and committed to have Jim be our director. Here we go. Frame up on that and get focused on it. Right. Start. I had this idea in my head that I wanted to make a Western. And yet I didn't feel like I was really capable in some ways of writing a, a period Western, you know, a Montana, Texas Western. So I thought about things I knew and how places I knew and people I knew would somehow work in that kind of structure. And what occurred to me is that I grew up in a town that was essentially kind of a modern frontier town where a lot of kind of white flight from New York City from the 70s had settled with their families and was very much a kind of outpost of people who absolutely detested New York City and had somehow built their first kind of homestead away from this place of mayhem and decline and ugliness and violence and we're very proud of setting up this new place. And what was always surprising to me is the way that all the dads went into the city to do their jobs, to protect the streets, to put out fires, EMS workers, but, but the families never went to New York. I mean, they would shop in Paramus. They were only an hour and a half away from the biggest city in the world, but they never went to New York City. And there was no connection to it except dad commuted there every day to kind of earn the daily bread. And somehow it struck me that this place if you looked at it the right way, it had this very Western vibe. It had this kind of, you know, everyone was very capable of defending themselves. Everyone was, you know, the, all the cops were packing weapons. They had a lot of anger about what it is they had escaped and how they were trying to start something new and something fresh and clean of kind of the dirtiness and chaos of the city. And somehow into that environment, it kind of seemed like, wow, you could, you could look at that as a new frontier, as a kind of suburban frontier. And from there, I kind of thought about how you could begin to build something interesting out of that sense of place and also that sense of anger about what was across the river. We made a place where things make sense. And you can walk across the street without fear. And you come to me with a plan to set things right. Everyone in the city holding hands, singing, we are the world. That's very nice. But Freddy, your plan is the plan of a boy. You made it on the back of a matchbook without thinking, without looking at the cards. I look at the cards. I see this town destroyed. In thinking about it as a Western, what I was concerned with is that the movie not just be this real life cop movie. It isn't. It's a fable. And in a sense, Westerns are fables. They are real constructions. You know, the Native American reservation is here, the Wild West town where lawlessness is here, the frontier, the, the homesteaders trying to build a beautiful place is here. Nothing was ever really that simple or clean in the real West. And in a sense, nothing is that simple or clean in the real world of cops and politics in the tri-state area of New York. Traffic incident? Oh, shit. But I wanted to make something clean so it was almost kind of a very simple um, tale about law and order at this point in this country. It's got such classic narrative lines about sort of the, the unsuspecting hero um, that is sort of in search of, of his moral purpose navigating through many different philosophies that are being forced and, and kind of breaking away and making a choice about, you know, what is right and what is wrong and what is right for yourself. It may not be right for everybody, and I think that's, that's really what the movie's about. It's an incredible script. I mean, I guess people say that all the time, but if you look at this cast and you realize that in the scheme of movies, it's a so-called low-budget film, you wonder how they got the cast that they did, and you just have to look to the words. It's like a very nearly perfect script. We developed the script for a, a little bit 
under a year and then started getting it out to just agents and Sly was the first person that came on board and that was an amazing moment. When I started out doing like Lords at Flatbush and you know changing in the back of a station wagon and all those starving actor stories and now you come back in a way that you've basically seen every aspect of the business and you long to be back in the back of the station wagon again. When the idea first came up for Sly to do this movie, it was really surprising to me. And something that I was like, you know, why would he want to play this character? He plays, you know, these men of intense decisiveness and action and physical strain. But that, in a sense, is why he was interested in the picture. I think Sly got to a point where he's very interested in making some kind of departure from the kind of roles that people expected him in. Well, I just thought it was an opportunity time for change and uh, it was presented by you know, Harvey Weinstein and the first time I read the script and then I saw his film Heavy and I realized he was an extremely fastidious and realistic filmmaker and then when I met him he had a rather uh, mature point of view mm -hmm. I thought excellent. After Sly agreed to do the movie it was just who are we going to put opposite him? that can somehow contain him and for the audience be a kind of physical, mental, and visceral intimidating force. Bob De Niro came on board shortly thereafter. Harvey Keitel got involved. Ray Liotta, who had always been a fan of the script and had seen it in some of its earlier forms, jumped in right away. So it just kind of again reinforced you know, the power of the writing and how great it is for actors, I think, when they finally get to read something that has meaning and has great characters. Listen, if my ain't gonna fucking hang me by the balls, it ain't gonna be over some fucking missing evidence. Figs, you've been a cop 12 years. Six grams missing, it's not a white size violation, babe. Come on. You bought that big old house, maybe you're trying to get out from under. Hey, Jack. What the fuck's up your ass? Are you gonna tell me you're getting by without gravy, any of you? I knew that what we had was this kind of incredible collection of masculine figures, all of whom kind of stood on very strong ground of their own, and all of whom would kind of balance the power, in a sense, dramatic power. I mean, I wasn't at that point, because I got to know each one of these guys as they came on the movie, I wasn't worried about star power. I was actually just worried about dramatic power, that, that there wasn't this kind of tremendous imbalance like lopsided imbalance, you know, in the scenes. The sense of the set was always an acting ensemble. Different levels of star, star hierarchy and stuff were very transparent and didn't really, for me, exist all that much. I've done a lot of ensemble pieces before and it's always a lot of, you know, managing and, and um, scheduling, but everyone loved the script and, and I think, you know, Bob De Niro, who started the show, you know, he worked with us the first two weeks of shooting, really was key in setting this great tone for keeping the independent spirit of this in the face of all of these powerful actors that have done big, big, big movies in Hollywood. Back up, back up. He can't hear. Ruben, take her. It's all right. They blew out his ears. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay. It's okay. 20 years ago, uh, Robert De Niro and myself, we opened up on opposite marquees with Taxi Driver and Rocky, and then both had gone on to be nominated. So this has been a course in our lives that obviously took rather drastic uh, diversions. And to come around 20 years later is pretty miraculous because I have been considered uh, to be part of another genre, and he in his own. So the coming together is, to me, a a very rare and spectacular uh, once-in-a-lifetime situation. Bob is just so involved in the work. It's an amazing thing to watch him work because long before you start shooting, he's just touching everything and thinking about everything and kind of taking in the physical world of his character. All right, Jackie, Mo Tilden. Hey. Robert Patrick was someone who I think delivers an amazing performance in the film and has an amazing physical presence as well. He's just an amazing looking man. You know, everyone knows him as the hunter or robot in T2 after Schwarzenegger, where he never spoke, I don't think, and just was kind of this amazing physical presence. Fucking fish! Ah! 
And it's like there's a level where each one of these men brings with them such a kind of cast of characters that you've seen before that it, there's a kind of interesting bigness to the story that comes from just seeing each one of them coming together. You know, Bob brings a history to the table. Ray Liotta brings a history to the table. Sly brings a history to the table. And Harvey Keitel brings a history to the table. And so, in some ways, you, you know these men very well the moment they arrive. And that works very well because you don't want to spend a lot of time like explaining everyone's histories and talking about what they came from. You know, you want to know that guy's law and order, that guy's about brotherhood, that guy's about protecting numero uno, and this guy's about trying to decide what the hell he's going to do in relation to what they're all saying. Wait, Don, gave you this job, Freddy. You forgot that? We made your sorry ass. So now you could do us a favor, huh? You could tell us where Superboy is. You know, one of the other actors in the film has been very helpful, Arthur Nascarelli, who plays Frank Laganda. He's a, you know, a, a former, you know, policeman. Arthur was at first someone who could help me with just details on the film, technical details, cop details, bits of dialogue adjustments, kind of checking some of the lingo I was using. But what happened after I met Arthur was it was just so clear what an incredibly gifted presence he was on, on camera. And as we were going through the casting process, partly because I hadn't really thought of him when I met him as an actor, I didn't really right away think he should play Laganda. And then suddenly it just occurred to me that every time I saw him, I felt like I was just breathing in this kind of incredible sense of reality about what it is to be a cop, what it is to be a cop who's seen a lot of things. And also what a help that wealth of information and texture would be to the other actors in the film. I was a member of the New York City Police Department for uh, 20 years and five months, exactly. And um, essentially I was an undercover. I bought drugs, that's what I did for a living for about, uh, about eight or nine years. And then I, I, I went over to uh, uh, the district attorney's office in Queens and I worked for the fellow, uh, John Santucci, who was the DA in Queens. I worked for him for 11 more years. And then, you know, I kind of just got involved in films about four or five years ago. And I've been lucky enough to be, you know, working pretty steady since I got started. When I first heard about the movie, I said, no, I don't want to do... All I knew it was called Copland, so I had passed originally. And then um, my agent said, just watch Heavy. It's this guy who, James Mangold, who did this movie Heavy. So I watched Heavy and was blown away by the choices, you know, that I felt he made as a director and the pace of it and the story. And so I called the next morning and said, I unpass, I unpass. I, I want to I be in this movie, and I didn't read the script or anything. Hi, can you turn your engine off for me? I got the arrow. You on the job? No, we're coming from Forest Hills, honey. I'm John McEnroe, that's Jimmy Connors. Cut! Jim, he's, he's wonderful to work with as, uh, as, a, uh, as an actor. He can communicate to you what he wants, and I think he has a really clean idea of what he wants. And he's really extremely sharp with his direction, uh, and has, he's totally fearless. You think with like what you were saying with the group of people that are involved, and this guy's, this is his second movie. The other was a small independent, but he doesn't shrink away from anything, and he, you know, he's right nine times out of ten, little bastard. Oh, well, Jim is very confident and very, uh, I liked him a lot. He's very good. He did a good job. Mm -hmm. To see him running a set, walking onto a set with Keitel, De Niro, Stallone, who, all these guys in our movie, and to just, to listen to everyone, to field, to field ideas, but to basically at a certain point say, okay, I've heard everybody, this is this, I'm the director. This is the story we're going to tell now. His poise is um, is very impressive to me, and I think he's probably going to be one of uh, one of our great directors in the years to come. He's forced to me into pockets and dark corners and cobweb-covered rooms that I have not entered into maybe ever. I have to give him credit. I give him total trust, too, which I have not done in a long time. Yeah, catch the door, watch him go away, and then come back inside. You can just lean toward camera and then kind of lean into your own chair. I like it. <laughs> okay.